So there's this neat thing called syncretism that happens in polytheistic religions where similar gods from different cultures can, over years of exchange, merge into one figure. And when two gods combine with each other, so do their family trees. And so when you have centuries of exchange between patriarchal societies, each of whom have their own chief god with his own far-reaching royal lineage, well, y you get Zeus. Or at least this is one popular explanation for why he has such a hard time keeping it in his tunic. Zeus, of course, had a number of children with his queen wife Hera, most notably Ares, the god of war, bloodlust, and courage. Ares wasn't exactly Zeus's favorite offspring, in fact, Homer puts Zeus on record saying his ass would have been kicked out of Olympus if he wasn't his son, but while he was certainly a fearsome god and from what we can tell relatively unpopular in cult worship, he still has his role as a deity as we see in Homeric hymn number 8 to Ares, where he's called on to grant courage and victory to those in turmoil. Zeus and Hera also had a daughter named Aletheia, goddess of childbirth. When the hero Heracles was about to be born, Zeus announced that the next male born of his line would rule as king over his homeland. But Hera, never a big fan of her husband's love children, commanded Aletheia to prolong Alcmene's labor long enough so that Eurystheus, another descendant of Zeus, could be born first, thus stealing Heracles' birthright. Zeus and Hera's other daughter was Hebe. Her name literally means youth, and as cupbearer of the Olympians, she represented the god's eternal youthfulness. After Heracles ascended to godhood, Hera offered him Hebe's hand in marriage as a peace offering to end their long-running feud. Also, according to Pseudo-Apollodorus, Zeus and Hera were the parents of the craftsman god Hephaestus. However, other sources say he was immaculately conceived by Hera after Zeus birthed Athena. I made other videos going into detail on each of those gods' births. Now, if we look Outside of wedlock, Zeus of course has many, many, many more kiddos. And I can only hope to scratch the surface in this video, but first a message from this video's sponsor. If you're anything like me, you've always wanted to be able to tell time on the go, but you just couldn't muster the gains to carry around your 200 pound full size vintage grandfather clock. That's why I was stoked to hear about this video's sponsor, Holtzkern, who makes neat little tiny clocks that fit on your wrist. Holtzkern is a small Austrian based company that spent the last seven years making all of these beautiful watches, all of which are designed using using natural materials, giving each accessory its own unique look. I like to keep it classy with their summer night wristwatch, made of lead wood and black marble. But I also love wearing the Amsterdam, which has little windows so you can look inside at its awesome self-winding movement. And all joking aside, it's actually shockingly extremely nice to be able to tell time just by looking at my wrist instead of pulling out my phone, which obviously is designed to pull my attention towards notifications, so I'll spend all day watching videos and scrolling through social media like the brain-dead zoomer that I am. But that's not all. Holtzkern also makes beautiful jewelry with their same signature style and craftsmanship, so you can get the perfect gift for a loved one or something to complement your own style. But if you have tiny baby hands like me, you should probably make sure you get the right ring size. This wasn't their fault, I just forgot I'm a small little guy. So if you want to up your style, you can click the link in the description and use code JAKE15 to get 15% off your purchase with Holtzkern and a free polishing cloth. Holtzkern also offers free shipping in the US and most EU countries, as well as a 24-month warranty. Thanks so much for your support, Holtzkern. Anyway, one notable love affair of Zeus's was that with the Theban princess Semele, with whom he conceived the god Dionysus. Despite his best efforts to hide his lechery, Hera of course found out about Semele and went to her in disguise. Under Hera's advice, she made Zeus swear an oath to grant her one wish, and then demanded that he court her in the way he would with his godly wife. Needless to say, Zeus's full-on god form was a bit much for her to handle, and she died of fright and was vaporized by his lightning. Luckily though, Zeus snatched up their feet his son Dionysus and stuck him inside his leg to finish baking. Now, Dionysus is a complicated god with a lot of disconnected myths from various localized cults, but Pseudo Apollodorus attempted to arrange some of these myths to form a coherent narrative of the god's early career. After Dionysus was born from Zeus's leg, he was sent to be raised by a king and queen named Ino and Athamas, until Hera drove them into a child murdering frenzy. So Zeus turned Dionysus into a kid, the goat kind, not the human kind, and brought him to live with some on a faraway mountain called Nysa. Other sources state that this was actually his original birthplace, likely as an attempt to etymologize his name as meaning God of Nysa. As a young god, his first accomplishment was of course inventing wine, but soon afterward Hera struck him mad. She really likes doing that. And he spent the next several years traveling around the world, partying, starting mystery cults, and sending people into murderous frenzies. Teenagers always have their phases. At one point he was kidnapped by some pirates, so to escape he unleashed otherworldly horrors upon 
on them and then turned them into dolphins. After this episode, he was finally recognized as a god and took his place among the Olympians. Another hookup of Zeus's was with the titan goddess Leto. But when Leto was in labor with the twin gods Artemis and Apollo, Hera, of course, made it her mission to make her life as difficult as possible and forbid any land from letting her give birth there. After wandering for a while, she ended up on the island of Delos, where she was finally accepted. But her trouble wasn't over yet because Hera also distracted Aletheia from leaving Olympus to grant Leto's children birth. So Leto's labor persisted for nine nights until the messenger goddess Iris showed up to tell Aletheia her services were needed. And finally, the gods Artemis and Apollo were born. Apollo was quite a well-rounded god. His talents included music, archery, medicine, oracular prophecy, and being a huge slut. Apollo's first notable accomplishment was slaying Python, a giant serpent guarding the Oracle of Delphi, after which he became the patron deity of the sacred region of Delphi and the highest god of prophecy. Another notable escapade of his was his music contest with the satyr Marcius. The goddess Athena invented the flute, but when she realized she looked silly while playing it, she tossed it away. When Marcius found it, he went to Apollo and challenged him to a contest where the winner could do whatever he wanted to the loser. Apollo then flipped the flute and played it upside down, a feat which Marcius couldn't hope to match, and Apollo was the clear winner. But don't worry, I'm sure Marcius got off easy. We also can't forget Apollo's many, many loves, like Daphne, who didn't exactly reciprocate his affection, and while running from his advances, asked Zeus to turn her into a laurel tree. Or Apollo's boyfriend Hyacinth, who unfortunately died in a tragic frisbee accident. Apollo isn't great at maintaining long-term relationships. This, of course, didn't stop him from being by far one of the most popular gods in the entire Greek pantheon. Popular enough, even, to apparently steal other gods' jobs. Remember what I mentioned about syncretism? Well, early tradition identifies Helios as a distinct god who drives his sun chariot across the sky each day. As time goes on, however, we start to see his role taken up by Apollo, with Helios either considered an elder titan god who was replaced, or an alternate form of Apollo himself. Then, of course, there was Apollo's twin sister, Artemis, who was a bit more of a black sheep. As a child, she asked for her father Zeus's permission to never marry, and went to live in the forest with her entourage of gal pals. Interpret that how you will. Her passion in life was hunting, but her main duty as a deity was to be a patron and protector of young women until their marriage, and to give aid to women in childbirth. Artemis usually didn't have a great relationship with men. Once a hunter named Actrian spied on her while she was bathing. When she noticed him, she transformed him into a stag, and then his hunting dogs tore him apart. She did, however, make friends with Orion, the giant son of Poseidon who could walk on water. Unfortunately, their friendship didn't last long. According to Hesiod, Orion was such a good hunter that the earth goddess Gaia got angry and sent a giant scorpion to kill him. However, in a much later version from the Astronomica, it said that Artemis loved Orion so much she considered breaking her vow never to marry. To prevent this, Apollo took her out to shore while Orion was strolling far out into the sea and was like, Hey, I bet you can't hit that ambiguous large object far off in the horizon. Oh, just you wait, bucko. Ow, I'm Artemis' best friend Orion, and now I'm dead. I feel so betrayed, blah. <gasps> what have I done? So yeah, I guess both those siblings have crappy love lives. And that's just to name a very small portion of Zeus's offspring. I actually wanted to cover a lot more in this video, but I'm a bit pressed for time right now because there are some other projects I'm eager to get started on over the next couple months. I'm glad, though, I was able to introduce you to a couple new gods as well as revisit some older ones in more thorough detail. And thankfully, there's still plenty more material I can work with for a future video on this subject. Because Zeus, um, well, he's Zeus.